the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. In the years leading up to the American Revolution, the galvanizing example of government overreaching were the so-called general warrants and writs of assistance that authorized the king's agents to break into the homes of scores of innocent citizens in an indiscriminate search for the anonymous authors of pamphlets criticizing the King of England. Writs of assistance, for example, authorized customs agents, quote, to break open doors, chests, trunks, and other packages in an indiscriminate search for stolen goods without specifying either the goods to be searched or the houses to be seized. In a famous attack on the constitutionality of the writs of assistance in 1761, James Otis said, it is a power that places the liberty of every man in the hand of every petty officer. John Adams said of James Otis' speech, then and there, the child independence was born. As a result, many state constitutions during the revolutionary era adopted versions of what would become the Fourth Amendment. That declares, quote, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And when the framers of the U.S. Constitution prohibited unreasonable searches and seizures of our persons, houses, papers, and effects in 1791, they were thinking about the search of one person's house in particular, that of the British rabble-rouser John Wilkes. Well, Wilkes had been elected to Parliament in 1757. He got into a little bit of trouble by founding a Whiggish scandal sheet. It was called the North Britain, and it was a kind of 18th century TMZ report. Lord Halifax, the King's agent, issued a general warrant authorizing the arrest of the printers and publishers and authors of North Britain without identifying them by name. Wilkes sued the King's messengers for trespassing on his property, and he urged a bunch of other publishers and printers who'd been arrested under general warrants to do the same. A jury awarded Wilkes a thousand pounds in damages. This was a ruinous amount in its day, a kind of McDonald's coffee verdict. So now let's fast forward to the United States Supreme Court's first encounter with electronic searches. This was a case called Olmstead versus United States. It was decided in 1928 at the height of the war on booze, and it arose when the federal government began to tap phones in an effort to enforce prohibition. Government agents in this case put wiretaps on the telephone cables under the sidewalks leading up to a suspect's office and they concluded that he was indeed a bootlegger. He objected that the wiretaps were an unconstitutional search because the government hadn't gotten a warrant. In an opinion by Chief Justice William Howard Taft, the former United States president, a majority of the court said, no trespass, no constitutional violation. Because at the time of the framing, you needed to violate someone's property rights in order to violate the Fourth Amendment, these justices held, the suspected bootlegger was out of luck since his property rights weren't violated. In a visionary dissenting opinion, my hero, Justice Louis Brandeis, disagreed. In the Wilkes trial, he noted, a far slighter intrusion seemed subversive of all the comforts of society. Brandeis insisted that the Constitution had to protect just as much privacy in the age of the wires as it did during the colonial era, whether or not a physical trespass was involved. Well, in 1967, the Supreme Court seemed to accept Brandeis's argument that technologically enhanced eavesdropping could qualify as an unreasonable search. In the Katz case, government agents put a listening device on a public telephone booth, and they recorded a gambling suspect's end of the conversation without his knowledge. Overruling the Olmstead decision, which had held that there could be no search or seizure without a physical trespass, the government announced that the Fourth Amendment protects people, not places. Because Mr. Katz, the suspected gambler, had taken steps to preserve his privacy by closing the door of the phone booth behind him, the court held that he reasonably expected his conversations wouldn't be monitored 
without a judicial warrant. In an influential concurring opinion, Justice John Marshall Harlan proposed the following Fourth Amendment test. Does a person have a subjective expectation of privacy that society is prepared to accept as reasonable? Well, this sounded like a victory for privacy, but there was just one problem with this test. It's entirely circular. As advances in the technology of monitoring and searching have made ever more intrusive surveillance possible, expectations of privacy have naturally diminished with a corresponding reduction in constitutional protections. Today, the great controversies involving the Fourth Amendment involve government surveillance such as the mass collection of telephone data, or the search of cell phones, or the tracking of suspects 24-7 using global positioning system devices, or flying drones. Now that most of our data is stored in databases owned by third parties, none of these searches require physical intrusions into our homes. And yet, they can reveal far more about our intimate activities than the general warrants that so outrage the American framers. Do you think it's an unreasonable search of your person or of your electronic effects for the government to collect the telephone numbers you dial, even if no human being actually sees them unless you're considered a terrorist suspect? These are the kind of issues Americans are debating today, just as we debated them in the days of John Adams, James Otis, and John Wilkes.